Dr. Gladys, thank you so much for making the time to be here. I'm so proud to be here. <laughs> You're so amazing. I'm already like getting an upgrade to my whole being just by being with you. Um, <laughs> you you've been doing so much to love this world, to help people shine, to help people find health. And uh, it's been a, a long but beautiful journey. Thank God. And you have a yeah. new book coming out. So I feel like before we go back into your, your, your journey, I just want to talk about this book because it's so eminent. Why did you want to write this? You've already shared so much. You've already given so much. What was it about the message of this book that you felt was really important right now? Well, my other books were all about, mostly about my concept of what medicine was all about, what healing and health and all of that was about. But this was more my juice. It was what, what made me uh, want to be able to do the things that I wanted to be able to do. So it was uh, an opportunity to um, investigate within myself, but also as I reached out to other people, the responses for that inner longing that we all have for our true humanity. And uh, it sounds to me like you and I are talking the same language. That's such a huge compliment um, because we all really live in different worlds depending <laughs> on how we perceive and how we right. speak. And that's a giant compliment for you to even say that. Uh, I would love to think that that's true. Just so people have a sense, uh, the new book is titled The Well-Lived Life, A 102-Year-Old Doctor's Six Secrets to Health and Happiness at Every Age. And it really is a marvel that you are uh, the, the, the age you are, and yet your spirit is uh, ageless, completely ageless. The amount of expansion, the amount of capacity you have for joy, the amount of um, goodness and ease that you have uh, is something I don't think I've ever seen in anyone at any age. So it's um, no <laughs> wonder, it's really not a wonder that you've been able to live because you're actually living. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this book then. And, and what do you feel like is one of those six secrets to living a healthy and happy life? Well, first of all, is for, to have something to live for. I can't tell you how many patients through the years I've asked them, well, what, what do you really have to live for? And they really have never, ever thought about it. And so the, the concept that each one of us is here for a purpose and that we ha have to identify that purpose so that we can actually begin to realize that, that, that it's our privilege to, to be able to live this life at this time. It's so true what you're saying. And I feel like I once heard someone say that the opposite of depression might actually be purpose. And what does it mean to you to have something to live for? And what is that? that people could maybe start to look for or reach for in their own life? Well, you know, I, I've tried a <laughs> hundred years to put it into words, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm joking at that. But <laughs> actually, I have kind of a little template that, that uh, identifies Amazing. the essence of it. And that is life. Without life, there's nothing. I mean, so that, forget anything else. So we life is the first... I'm calling them my five L's. So life is the first one. You got to start someplace and life is where to start. But life is like a seed. You can have a seed in the pyramids for 5,000 years and nothing happens. It's got all the energy of the universe within that seed, but nothing happens until love activates it in the in the like water and somebody paying attention to it and doing something with it. At that point, love and life combine and become 
the essence of what life is all about. Um, it's like the sperm and the ovum. It's it, One without the other is useless. But together, they are life itself. Mm. So start out with those two together. And then the third one is laughter. Laughter without love is cruel. It's mean. It's cold. But laughter with love is joy and happiness and harmony. The fourth one is labor. I'm getting mixed up. The fourth one is labor. Labor without love is drudgery. It's mean. It's hard. I got to go to work. Oh, There's sure. many diapers. You know, it's just too hard. But labor with love is bliss. I mean, that's why you do what you do. It's why I'm, why a singer sing, why, it's, why a painter paints. It's, it's, it's what we, in our inner being, know that we're at bliss when we're doing what we're doing. And the fifth one, fifth L, is listening. Listening without love is an empty gong. It's an empty sound. It doesn't mean anything. But listening with love is understanding. So beautiful. And so these five L's um, kind of put my philosophy together. It, it doesn't. It doesn't add up to the whole thing, but it's the sort of the undergirding of my philosophy. I mean, it's such a beautiful philosophy. And at the same time, what makes it even more compelling is that you are indeed somebody who's been in the world of medicine and holistic medicine. And one of the things you talk about in the book is that love is also the most powerful medicine. It is. Um, can you explain after having all of the experience that you've had in your life, why you think that love winds up being the most powerful medicine for those of us who are wrapped up in a culture of thinking we need Tylenol or some pharmaceutical or some intervention. Um, why would we start to believe or know that love is actually maybe the most powerful medicine? Well, you know, our Native American sisters and brothers understood that to, to start with. My parents, who went to India as missionaries out into the jungles of North India, understood that. They didn't identify it as such. But the whole concept of love being the essence of what healing is all about is essential. Um, my oldest son is a, a retired orthopedic surgeon. And when he came through town here, he um, was going to start his practice in Del Rio, Texas. And he said to me, Mom, I'm scared. I'm real scared. I'm going to go into the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said to him, well, Carl, if you can understand that it's your job, which is an amazing job as an orthopedic surgeon, you have the capacity to do amazing things. But when if you, after you've finished your job and done the best that you can, if you can't turn that healing process over to the patient and support them as they do their own healing, that's right. You you have a right to be scared. But if you can do that, you have nothing to be scared of because that's love reaching out to love. And I think it's that essence of, of knowing when, and I call it the physician within the patient. Each one of us has within us our own healing ability. And if we can recognize that and work with that, the healing not only starts, it continues and it works. Wow. I mean, it's so beautiful. Um, Deepak Chopra was on the show and I spent a weekend with him and he said, doctors create the conditions for which the patient patient could potentially help heal themselves, right? Like, you know, if anything, it's just a, another helpful facilitator for you to ultimately do your work in healing right. yourself. Right. And you're such a master of that. And when it comes to aging, 
I feel like society has really gotten it wrong. Like when I Uh think about, when I think about like what you already said in this few moments of such beauty already, like purpose, you know, what do we see? We see people retire from their purpose. And then we see the average life expectancy correlate with the retirement age, you know, and we see people in these blue zones living into their hundreds and they're just thriving. And I just would love to hear from you what you think and what you see that people are getting wrong about aging and how they maybe could change the paradigm of how they see it because how they see it is in fact what it winds up being because that's what they believe to be true. And because uh, every moment is what's important that yeah. each one of us, if, if I, when I was 50, I had believed that I was 50 and wow, as I look back, all the things that were happening happening at that time. But now at 102, I look around and all the things that are happening are just as exciting and just as important because today goes into tomorrow and tomorrow goes into the next day. I mean, it's it's the process of life, which is has to flow. We have to make it work or we kill it. And if, if we stop living, if we stop moving, if we stop actually moving even a small part of our body, we can't really function. You know, even blinking an eye is moving. And another thing that we've gotten wrong, too, is that when a doctor tells a patient, go home and get some rest now. You need to, to need to, you've been at your computer too long. You've got to get some rest. They, a lot of people take it as, well, I give up. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm supposed to rest, I just give up. I, I, I don't have anything to do. But the problem with that is that uh, if you give up, it's not resting. If we ask you to rest, that's doing something. It's not doing nothing. So it's it's how we understand it. It's how we want to work with it. It's what the process all is. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's that. You know, I feel like I'm, I know this sounds maybe crazy, but maybe not, but I feel like speaking to you is like my closest shot at like calling God on the phone. Oh my. <laughs> um, and I think it's because, you know, when somebody has the capacity to receive this level of life, you've kind of, your vibration is just uh, so in sync with love, right? And so that's like why I probably say that. But I guess I think to myself, wow, what do I want to ask her? And what I want to ask you is, you know, having grown this podcast, meeting lots and lots of women, I can tell you there's so much suffering going on inside people's heads. Oh. And I just feel like, what would you say to the women who are in their thirties and forties who beat themselves up, give themselves such a hard time, want to put things in the world are constantly in their resistance around, am I good enough? Is it enough? I didn't make the right choices. What am I doing to be the best parent? I mean, the amount of bandwidth that is spent on shame and criticism of self is so destructive and exhausting. And I I imagine it can't be good for our health. So what would you say to those women in their thirties and forties who spend too much time with that microscope on all of their flaws and, uh, and, and not enough time just in flow, just in allowing, just in, you know, inspired action, let's say. Yes. Being aware that, that life is so important and life and love, but you know, I I had to learn that because uh well when I before I went to school life was idyllic. I mean I thought you know everything was fine. We were in tents in the jungle and all, you know, it was great. But then I got to school and I couldn't read. 
I knew the alphabet. I knew the numbers. But when I started to try to read, they were all over the page. And I was so severely dyslexic that I had to repeat first grade twice. Oh. And I didn't really understand that I gave up my an aspect of my true voice until I was 93. I mean, I was I would repeatedly do something. I'd write a book and I'd say, yeah, but Bill edited and so and so on. Or somebody would say, well, thank you for saying that. And I'd say, well, that comes from. I was constantly deflecting what I had just said and had not was not claiming it. And in the not claiming it, I was actually at some level denying it, maybe not for everybody else, but denying it for myself. And then <laughs> I had a dream. Now, I dreams are very important to me. So and I know they are you to, to you, too. But in the, I was 93 and um, I woke up singing and uh, laughing. And I thought, but, you, you know, that in, in between stage where you're neither here nor in the dream nor. Well, that's where I was. And I th what I saw was that um, I saw Gladys as a seven year, a nine year old in the jungles of North India. And I was uh, coming out of our tent. So I pulled the tent flap back and I'm looking out to make sure that my uh, younger brother isn't there because he'd probably tattle on me because I was I knew what I was going to do. And we weren't allowed to sing anything but hymns and pudgeons on su on Sunday morning. <laughs> and I didn't I thought it was a stupid rule. So I wanted to do it my way. And nobody was around. So I ran as fast as I could climb the mango tree clear to the top. And I'm sitting up in the mango tree and I'm singing. I'm and I'm singing it, the caterpillar song and any old thing that I wanted to sing. But every so often, I'd look over my shoulder, my right shoulder, and Jesus was in the tree with me. And I looked at him and I said, um, Jesus loves the little children, right? And he laughs and he says, yes. And then I go back to my singing and then I begin to doubt again. And I think, Jesus, I'm still a little children, right? And he says, yes, so I go back to singing. But that's when I woke up. And when I woke up, I realized that I had been not denying my voice all this time, not because we were told not to sing or anything, but because I really didn't think I had the voice to say anything. And uh, and, and I mean, you in, <laughs> go through... Uh, two years as a six and seven year old kid where you're the class dummy, the other kids think you are, the teacher thinks you are, and it you get a pretty good dose of uh, damage that's done that uh, you can't really uh, uh, understand. Yeah. It, it's just it's a, such a deep scar that you can't understand it. And so uh, wow. That really set me free. That is so beautiful. It brought tears to my eyes. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. And one of the things you talk about in the book and through your work is learning to know that you have intuition and you can be your own medicine for yourself. You, you, you can be your own physician, your inner yeah. physician. Yeah. And I think we do exactly what you just said. We we just outsource our adequacy. We outsource the knowledge somebody else knows better. And this is so crucial, right? The returning to the sanctuary within the knower that knows, the part of us that's connected to God, the part of us that's connected to the divine answers. How do we walk ourselves back home to that? Well, let me tell you... <laughs> build up to that question. 
I am so concerned about what we've done to birthing and what we've done to our womanhood by telling ourselves that we can't deliver, (laughs) that we have to have someone else deliver our babies. Mm. That's wrong. It's taking me, I keep finding myself saying something like, well, I delivered so on. No, the mothers birth babies. We help them birth babies. I'm thrilled to be able to help mothers birth babies. But we have completely robbed women of the essence of the the very essence of their power, which is birthing a baby. And, you know, it's, it's uh, a, a we, we haven't just injured, injured that. We've damaged it really deeply. And uh, enough so that I have to catch myself not to say I, de- I delivered such and such a baby. It's the mother's privilege and responsibility, but she's the only one that can do it. It's so fascinating. You know, when I I have three daughters, thank God. And uh, when I had my first daughter, um, I remember having been told by a friend that if you ask the nurse in the labor and delivery room, they can put these bars on the bed that you can hold on to and you can squat. And I remembered when I got into the labor and delivery room and it was, it wasn't coming along quickly. And I said to the nurse, Hey, isn't there a way where you can put some bar on this bed so I can actually be in a position to squat? And my husband and the nurse said to me, what are you talking about? Nobody does that. Very few people do that. That takes a tremendous amount of strength. Just go with what we're saying. And I said, no, I want to try it. And sure enough, there I was, the bed kind of moves into this other kind of position so that you're now you're, you're, you're in the bed, but the bed now has like a bottom part and these yeah. squat bars go on. And, and what happened? I delivered the baby because Absolutely. I had, I could do it because I was empowered because I was on my feet because I was, and I, I've never felt so strong. I could cry just thinking about it. I named my daughter Gabrielle, which means God is my strength because I felt stronger than they told me that I was. And that experience gave me so much. And I can't believe that I have to ask and beg versus laying backwards in a position where I have no agency over my body. And you're so right. And nobody talks about this. No, no. When I started medical school, (laughs) the uh, World War II, I started medical school in 41 in September. Um, Yeah. And, and and World War II started in December, all right? All through that, we were learning about uh, birthing babies and so on. But, but well, the, the whole um, thought form at that time was the basis of what we're still working with. And that was to relieve women of pain during childbirth. It was called, you know, the, this awful amount of anesthesia. I had my first two uh, in that condition. I didn't know that my first son was a boy until 24 hours afterwards. And in medical school, we were taught how to use forceps. Because, you see, if the woman is totally anesthetized, she can't push the baby out. So how are you going to get the baby out? Well, I was I got to be real good at that. I was good, I could even help a mother with an after coming head. It was something that you learned, it was a technique that you learned, and it was all on the basis of trying to help the mother so that she didn't have any pain. And nobody thought about anything else but that that aspect of it in fact in in the 70s i was uh i had a young uh 
person with me at uh, who was from the University of Cincinnati, and we were going to the hospital for her birthing. And on the way home, he said to me, that's the first spontaneous delivery I've seen without forceps. Without forceps mm-hmm. in the 70s. Now, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I had my last two at home, but I created the baby buggy program and a lot of other things because women were, uh, well, Bob Bradley had written a book about a husband coach childbirth and so on and so forth. But the movement was there. And now, uh, right now, my vision for, for the future of my life in uh, on this planet, I really, really want to have created a village for living medicine where the people who are there as workers, the people who are there living there, everybody understands the whole concept of we have this power within us, but you start out with the birthing and the birthing has to be a loving birth center, not just a delivery center. You know, we deliver pizzas, we deliver speeches, we don't deliver babies. So it's the loving birth center where the mother can do what she wants to do, what she needs to do. I have one wonderful patient who danced her baby out. I swear she danced the whole time and it was just part of the music and the baby came with it. That's the the reason I went to Afghanistan was because the people, women in Afghanistan were, well, the highest birth rate in the world was in Afghanistan. And we, and uh, the uh, future generations, my brother was, was head of that. Couldn't find out why. And so uh, I was just getting ready to return, retire from my practice, which was with my daughter who's still practicing but um, uh, so he asked me if I would come and see what we could find out. And the, the basics in a, in a sentence, they were, those women were so um, schooled in what they couldn't do. In other words, as soon as they got pregnant, they had no uh, Calcium creating foods, no yogurt, no eggs, no uh, carrots. Mm-hmm. You know. And when they went into labor, they were kept, they weren't given anything to eat and drink. So now, uh, I said to them, "How? What? Ha- you're doing the big, the most important and hardest job in the whole world, and you say you can't." Feed yourself? Well, one woman said, so they were looking at each other, and one said, I'll bet some man figured this out. Well, I think so. I think the whole concept of not having any pain is because men can't stand to hear a woman cry out in the birth of pain, not understanding that there's a a dimension of pain that that goes beyond what you're trying to uh, stop. And and so it, it we had, well, we had a wonderful experience and we're able to teach them how to, and how to really uh, feed themselves and, and they accepted it and understood it. And there were 34 in the little groups that we had. And when they went home, within a year, the birth rate was, improved tremendously and both for mother and baby i you know it's uh wow. intuitively know what to do we and our bodies know this if we just pay attention to it. but the problem is the whole field the whole world has been so caught up in the pain yeah that they forget the life force that is what you're working with when you're birthing a baby. Yeah. It's a uh, 
masterful example of where it all breaks down. Right. And that's why that was where you went when I asked you that question, but you know, what do you think you would say to the women who are spending time outsourcing their sense of self, who are spending so much time suffering unnecessarily in their minds? Um, what might you want them to know in order to live a, a more joyful, healthier life? Believe in the fact that life really is a wow, but you have to look for it. If you look for darkness and pain, you find it. If you look for light and hope, you find it. Not in big bunches all the time. Sometimes it's just a little glimmer. Sometimes it's just a, a word that is said. But if you're looking for it, you find it. If you're not looking for it, you don't find it. You've lived through so many seasons of the world. And as you said before, you were doing this before World War II broke out and you've seen so much across yeah. the world. But in the time that you've had to now have this experience and to have perspective over time, what's your view of the world and the way people look at it? And is there anything that we're, we're assuming about the world that actually isn't really true? Yeah, yes, definitely. I think the world is caught up with pain and suffering and fear and all sorts of negative things that stop you if you get given half a chance. And I think that we're losing our true humanity. Our true humanity is the aspect of ourselves that understands that we were given dominion over the earth, not dominance. We're given mm -hmm. the, the right and the privilege to be the ones who can do these things. And we've forgotten it. We've it's forgotten so it. It's so true. Yeah. When people buy this book and it comes out on May 2nd and we'll put the link out and we'll make sure that people have a way to go grab it. What's, what's one thing that you hope that people will have after they read it? What's something that you hope stays with them? That love and hope are essential and the movement, movement, movement of the thoughts, but movement of the body also are really, really important. We have to move or we get stuck. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And um, since you mentioned that you went to school in first grade and before that you hadn't been in school, um, were you living with your parents who were missionaries in India up yes. until that point? Yeah. Yes. And well, what do you. Until, until I was 15. Yeah. And then at 15, they put you in school. No, I came to the States and went to college. And you hadn't been to school yet. Oh, yeah. And I went to. I was in. We had a school up in the mountains. It was, right. Yeah. But you didn't start until first grade. Is that right? Yeah. I started at first grade. Yeah. And then what do you think now about school and people in school? Do you think that there's anything that we should be um, sort of aware of or cautious about when it comes to putting kids in school, putting them through school? And, you know, what is what really is the benefit and maybe the actually challenge of school as you see it? Well, I think that reading, writing and arithmetic are really nice, but I think that the arts and that we've taken out of the schools and so on. The, uh, you know, those things are, when I, when I was going through school, we had some, you know, special things that we did and, and so on. I'm, I'm sa sad to see that those things are being taken away. Yeah. My last question is, you know, it seems as though no matter what it is that we talk about or what it is that you write about, it all comes back to finding within yourself real power, real joy. And for people living in the day to day who are living a, a pretty sort of, um, uh, I guess the Scared. word. Would be, yeah. How do, how do they raise their vibration? How, how do you keep yourself in a state of 
grace and joy and expansion so that you don't get sucked into all the fear? Well, you know, those fear things happen. They, they, they catch up to you. But I look at it as sort of like having a flashlight in the dark and you have each step is just as far as that flashlight goes. And there are times when you can't really go any farther than that. I mean, you're so stuck in something that's going happening and all of that, that you can't go any farther, but you can go that far. You know, that's it. You can, you can have that light in your hand and you can move that far and you can go and you can go and you can go. That's so beautiful. I love that. And I think we can, we can go that far. Right. Um, thank you for all of this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being who you are. We will put the book, the link so that everybody thank can get you. it and just keep shining. You are such a thank light. You. And you too. Thank you. God bless you, Dr. Gladys. All right. Hey, bye-bye.